indoors. So welcome everybody, um, especially Inan and Natalie for being here today. Um, we've got a husband and wife screenwriter team and their last film, Paper Spiders, which was directed by Inan, uh, was released in the theater and on demand back in May 2020. Is that right? Uh, this year, 2021. 2021. Okay, good. Um, it won Best Film, Best Screenplay, Best Actress Awards at the Boston Film Festival. We've got a Gotham Award nomination for Lily Taylor's lead performance. And this was... Um, you know, a special film for everybody. Um, Inan's directorial debut was the thriller The Millionaire Tour, which was co-written by Natalie as well, starred Dominic Moynihan. Inan and Natalie also wrote Beautiful and Twisted, starring Rob Lowe, Kaz Vega, and Candace Bergen. Natalie is a marriage and family therapist and so draws from her field experience in psychology. Um, they live in Los Angeles with three children. Um, and really, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Um, thank you for having us, like Christine Kobe. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. And especially thank you for sharing your film with us at no cost for the students because it was really important for them to be able to see it and always helpful for college students in December to get things for free. So we really appreciate you sharing the film with us as well. Um, we've got Toby Rosenthal on Zoom. She is a master Zoom orchestrator. And so I encourage everybody on Zoom to have the chat open. We're gonna have you participating. You'll be able to submit questions. Toby is gonna keep tabs on things in the chat. But especially if you're on Zoom, try to have the chat open um, so you can answer questions. And right now in the chat, if you could write what your major is, we'd like to give Natalie and Anand a sense of who's in the room. Um, and so partly that's by knowing majors. So please let Toby know what your major is in the chat. Um, and while that's coming in, just wanted to say thank you to the psych program, to the communication studies program, and the Sarah and Sam Schofer Holocaust Resource Center all work together to make this event happen today. So we're really happy um, that it actually did. Um, so who's in, the, who's in the room, Toby? We have lights of, lots of psych. We have lots of communication studies folks, um, social work. We have who else? They all flew in. They're listening, which is amazing. Hey. Um, forensic psychology. We have com folks who are adding the business major. So double majors representing health sciences. Oh, good. Uh, they're all here. They're okay. all here. That's good. So we will do this sort of combination and we're going to try our best to hit on three main areas. Um, the first area really focuses on you all and your college experiences and careers, like how it brought you to this point of making a feature film in Hollywood um, at what appears to be a relatively young age <laughs> by looking at you. Um, so all the students in the classroom are first year students. This is their first semester of college and they're eager to get themselves on a track to success. So any advice that you might have or examples of um, challenges would be helpful. Then we wanna talk about the actual content of the movie. So what it's like to present about mental illnesses in film, some of the challenges, why that was a topic that was important to you. And then last, the actual making of a movie, right? So what just questions about what it's like, what's, what's exciting and difficult, and then also potentially how the pandemic played a role in making this actually happen. Um, so those are the three main areas of questions. So people on Zoom, stay tuned. Like that's, if you have a question about a particular area, please make sure you put it into the chat. Um, and we'll start with just a chance for you all to, you both to introduce yourselves, um, talk a little bit about um, maybe your own college experiences, if you went to college, and the path that brought you to be movie makers at this point. Go ahead. Okay, well, hello, my name is Natalie. Um, I went to college at Cal State University Northridge, which is in California, and Enon went to University of Southern California, USC, and um, we, we didn't know each other when we were in college. We met, so we were both writing, we were screenwriting majors, um, and then I got a master's in marriage and family therapy, but that was later. But before that, we were writing alone and then we, we met and we started writing together. And that really helps having a writing partner. Um, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but um, but uh, pick up wherever I 
left off. I'm uh, I'm Israeli. I'm from Israel. I came here 18 years ago. Um, went to community college in Los Angeles and then transferred to the production program at uh, USC, University of Southern California. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's a it's a good film school. It uh, definitely helped with uh, with the journey. Learned a lot. Met a lot of uh, good people. But um, I think that the experience that you gain by doing specifically in, in production um, is just something that, uh, that school helps a lot with. And actually, you get a lot of hands-on experience in film school as well. But it's really the experience that you gain just by doing and very often trying and failing, whether it's in writing or whether it's in production. Um, the more you, you learn a lot from failures, uh, very often more than successes. And you just you know, keep doing it and, uh, and keep hustling. And, uh, that's the key because it's such a tough industry so really like it's you just have to keep you have to be resilient and know that failure is a part of it and keep going and it's it's difficult but it will ultimately you know make you stronger and make you better yeah. and and you can look back at your stuff and realize that you got better just from the pra- writing and practicing yeah um, I, I remember in um uh in at usc a lot of teachers and and, and speakers often coming in and saying you know, either write what you know about or, you know, do really good research if you're writing about something that's, that's not specifically what you know about, but try to focus on the areas of passion, the areas where you have some relative or comparative advantage to other people, where you know something that other people don't. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it really, it, it is meaningful to, to write about things that, that you're really passionate about. First of all, you're going to end up spending a very long amount of time working on those things. I mean, very often... I mean, a project to this day, till yesterday, we're still working on things related to the project. Years. So you spend, yeah, you spend years working on a project. And, uh, and even when you spend less than that, I mean, you want something that you're really passionate about and something that you have an angle, uh, an insight into that other people may not. Um, like many other fields, the business of uh, film is so saturated. So many people want to be, so many people want to tell their stories and tell a story and, um, and if you want to stand out in a way, it's very good to uh, bring something that, that you know or that you have that is different from other people's experiences, then you can tell it with greater authenticity. But it is hard at that age. I remember being in your position and, and thinking, because I heard that from teachers and thinking, what do I know that you know everyone else doesn't know? Um, and so maybe it's your own story or your own experience or what you've been through. Um, and I, it, it took me like kind of years to realize that, that that's really where you, where you excel. Um, and you, you know, you know your life best, you know, your, your experience is best. So try to find like that, you know, special angle. Yeah. And, and, and naturally, I mean, not everyone, not everyone has a personal story that they, that they want to share in, in film form. And it's not easy, not easy to make indie dramas about personal stories um, or difficult subjects, but, uh, but still bringing something from yourself, something that is a passion of yours that is uh, maybe very often doesn't seem to be in the mainstream, but it's still something that you specifically have insights into that other people don't, um, I think really helps as a, as, as a storyteller um, to, the, to the people here who are interested in, uh, in storytelling and film and communications. Okay, so we've got questions out of our classroom. So who's first? Come on, people. These are my freshmen. They're still a little quiet. All right, I'll go. Thanks, Tim. Can you hear me? Yep. Well, I know you can. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, my question was just like with the nature of being um, in the film industry, was there any aspects in the movie about uh, delusional disorder that you feel you weren't able to properly portray or that you feel like you wish you could have uh, went further into explaining? Um, no, it, it just, we, we actually had uh, um, a lot of creative control in this project, unlike many other ones. Um, it, most projects uh, never materialize, uh, most projects that we write. I mean, I think that for every, for every 10 screenplays that we write, you know, one gets made. So very, very often you have producers uh, in control who want to make a lot of changes with material and uh, um, we've written 30, 40 drafts and certain scripts based on just producer's notes and executive's notes. This wasn't the case with this one. Um, uh, we had excellent producers and a great creative team and everyone knew what the story is about and what we want to do with it. So um, we actually, we had the creative control to, um, 
to just do what we want. So I feel but like we that. also had two hours, you know, to, to explain yeah. what could people could be going through for a lifetime. So um, it was definitely a challenge to condense everything into two hours. Um, so, so, you know, we tried to do best with that, with, you know, the, the ups and downs, <laughs> um, the hope sometimes the, you know, the struggles, the, um, everything we tried to condense, but. Um, and we did it, want, want to present a, 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 a more optimistic hopefully. ending um, which we felt was realistic, but still, but still more optimistic. I had a screenwriting teacher at USC who said, um, uh, you can take your audience to hell, but you have to bring them back. And it resonated with me. Um, I feel like even when we discussed making this, uh, making this movie, and our first thought was this could be a very, very sad movie. And in order to make it more palatable, it would be useful to try to inject a little bit of natural humor and levity, and then also try to find a way out of it that, that, that suggests some hope and optimism um, still in a way that, that maintains realism, but, um, uh, but it was important for us to live on a, on a note of hope um, rather than just depress people, especially since it's, it's, such a, it's such a real problem. And not just, you know, persecutory delusional disorder. I mean, just dealing with mental illness, of course, for the people who are struggling with it, but also for family members who are struggling to support um, loved ones with uh, mental illness. Um, we actually were very fortunate to have the support of uh, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, um, who uh, the, the national director joined our um, uh, joined our premiere and uh, and many other chapter heads joined uh, um, regional screenings and festivals and uh, and contributed to a very lively conversation about the subject matter and you realize when you talk to people about it just how how prevalent it is to have a loved one with some kind of a you know mental disorder that people very often don't talk about um, and uh, um, and the value of bringing it up into the open and discussing it um, and even discussing it publicly, which wasn't an easy, mm -hmm. easy feat for us. So we yeah, never, we, as, go no, when we started, we didn't, we were, you know, we were going to keep it secretive. I mean, we would lived the secret for so many years that we took to then to just make a movie and go tell the world felt like such a crazy thing to do. Um, we should probably preface by saying that the, that the story is inspired by uh, Natalie's relationship with her mom. Um, it's not exactly based on, it's not a, I mean, there's a, there are a lot of things that we that we changed and added and and uh, but just the essence of of a uh, of a loved one trying to help a family member with uh, uh, struggling with mental illness and specifically with paranoia and, and you know delusional disorder um, that aspect of it was was very real mm -hmm. and at a time when when Natalie was living through a, a similar situation with her mom who was a very sweet per person kind and loving and wonderful in every regard. It was only in this narrow aspect of, of, of um, uh, mental health that she, that she was afflicted with a problem that she didn't choose. And, uh, and it was very heartbreaking to see her living in a nightmare that we couldn't wake her up from. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we never imagined that we would just tell people, we didn't even tell our friends and some, and, and some family members about what was going on with her. Uh, we felt like it would be a betrayal of our trust. Mm -hmm. So uh, it definitely was not an easy decision to decide yeah. to just go ahead and make a movie. We actually didn't it. even think that the movie would get made. It was sort of like a processing experience. Um, and then, and then the, after, you know, we, we started writing it and talking to people, we realized how many people have similar situations where they know somebody who has mental illness or somebody in their family, a friend, or um, any kind of mental illness. And also specifically like some, you know, delusions of paranoia, yeah. paranoia um, yeah. that really surprised me how common it is. And I guess just people don't talk about it because of the stigma and the shame. Um, and so that was very, you know, um, inspiring to, to be honest and upfront about it and, yeah. you know, uh, to bring that story to light. I mean, if I had seen a movie like this when I was growing up, I, I, you know, I think about that all the time, like what would I have done differently? Um, and, and would that be helpful just knowing that you're not alone in this? Um, so that's like what I take away most from it, that you're not alone when, when you think you are a lot of the time. When, when Natalie was going through a similar experience with her mother, she was already a marriage and family therapist herself. So she was a mental health professional. She already had two kids. Now we have three. So she was already an adult with, a, with me and her family and a, and a system of support that the character in the movie doesn't have. We try to distill the experience in the movie to, uh, to one that focuses more on just on a relationship. And we felt like we had some other ideas for a coming of age story and it just felt right to make this a coming of age story because of the turning tables in which a child is suddenly forced to, to uh, take care of a parent. So uh, that was part of the reason why we changed that aspect of the story. But in terms of the, the paranoia, 
it, uh, it actually, I think, is uh, very close to uh, what the actual experience was. That's great, thank you. I just wanna jump in because in this class where we've read different books, I just wanna point out to the whole audience um, that's so consistent where it's, it's fearful, people are afraid to talk about it, but when they do, they're embraced, right? And so there certainly is stigma and rejection, um, but one of the characters in a book that we read, Marbles, she was afraid to tell anybody she had bipolar disorder. And then when she did, people's responses were a lot like you both said, like, oh, me too, I had that too. My mother had that, my brother has this. And so once we actually talk about it, it's not at all what we expected, like what stopped us from doing it and why we kept it a secret. Um, I often say like these guys, this classroom, a lot of the students on board, um, they are the generation that is changing this conversation where they're far more likely to disclose, to be honest about what they're going through and thankfully get help for it as well, right? So you're turning that into the action. Um, and I think it's films like this that allow that to happen. You know, it's giving these young people a freedom that we didn't really have, um, people who are older than that. Um, and that can only be good. <laughs> you know, it can only be good for people to get the help that they deserve. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. It's just so consistent that once you're honest, actually, for the most part, you're embraced and supported. Um, and that that's a really important part of, you know, being honest about what's going on. Um, the second thing I'd like to talk with you guys about, because my class and I talked about this on Thursday. Um, so the, the end of the film. So she decides to leave USC and come back to be with her mom. And for my room full of students, it felt a little unfair. <laughs> you know, it felt a little bit like she had to give up her future to, to take care of somebody else. Um, and it also is a very mature and generous decision that the character made, right, to, to do that for her mom. Um, so why, and, and you talked about this film giving hope. So how did you see that as hope and how did you decide to have her make that decision to, to leave USC and come back to, to take care of her mom? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, so the hope for me was more for the fact that there's hope that she can get better. So when when, yeah. I was, when we were thinking about hope, it was more that this isn't all doom and gloom. Like there 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 are cases, you know, with medication and treatment. And once you even are aware of the problem, because so much of the problem is the lack of awareness, and then you can't get help because you're not even aware you have a problem. So that resistance is usually the biggest problem. So the hope was, you know, the the acknowledgement that there is a problem, and the, mm -hmm. then the possibility for treatment. Um, there's a scene at the end, we can talk about that scene where it's not, you know, total, total, you know, totally gone, but she's looking at yeah. the with like a tiny hint that she's looking at the roof and she's still going to hear noises and, you know, you probably It'll never be a lifelong heard. process. A lifelong too. Yeah. problem and process. But um, the, in terms of sacrifice, like having lived with somebody with mental illness, there's constant sacrifices that you make when you love somebody. Um, and that, th that's a very big decision that she chose to stay back and go to a you know local college, but it was a symbol of some of the sacrifices that people living you know with somebody that they love who has mental illness make. Um, and so we we tried to be true for from and pull from different aspects of of and also personal things that you know have happened. So it's definitely not true for everybody, but um, for, for us, we tried to take you know certain aspects that that were authentic you know to yeah. to my life and. And, 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 and in a way, actually, even to mine, even though the movie is, is inspired by Natalie's story, maybe that's one aspect of it that was um, that came from my mind. As I mentioned, I'm from Israel, and since I was a kid, I always dreamed of uh, coming to uh, to LA and studying film. And USC is considered a good film school, and I um, and and it was and it was a dream. But it often occurred to me, what if certain circumstances or tragedies or health problems with family would have prevented me from doing that? And it didn't seem it didn't seem impossible that, that there would be a situation. And a lot of people do make sacrifices, and there's a reality to it. And a lot of caregivers and 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 um, caretakers end up making making sacrifices. On the flip side of it, I think that what we also see in the movies at the beginning of the story, part of why she wanted to go specifically to USC is because it was the the alma mater of the of her father. And in a way, it was it was an attempt to connect with her father, who she lost earlier, and uh, and it was just like trying to connect with a piece of him that she didn't know. And once she goes to the college and she hears stories about him, 
in a way, she, there's a little bit of satisfaction that she, she got what she wanted in a way, and then she can go study, study uh, um, medicine elsewhere. Um, but it still is a sacrifice. And we felt like part of the truth and the reality of the situation is that caregivers often, uh, often have to make sacrifices. It's frustrating. If that is. Yeah. It's frustrating, but I think it is an honest part about being a caregiver. And so it's nice to see that portrayed. Um, and, and I think also at, at the developmental age of college students, like they haven't yet had to take on that role of taking care of their parents. Um, but most of us do develop into that to some degree and as parents age. Um, so that this was just such a young age for, for Melanie to have to, to take that on. Yeah. 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 That's good. I see that we missed a couple of questions in the chat. So let me just quickly um, go through them. Um, sure. There is one, should, should I read them out loud? Yeah, sure. yeah that'd be great. Thanks. Sure. So one says, uh, um, I'm a psychology major. Uh, one of my minors is Jewish studies. I'm learning at the Stockton Holocaust Research Center, looking at the psychological aftermaths of those families. Was this one of your passions in making this film? It's actually a, a really interesting question. Um, uh, and there is a very subtle connection which, um, which is definitely not evident to most people watching the film. Um, coming from, from so the, as I mentioned, I'm Israeli and Natalie is Jewish and, and Holocaust is, um, is part of the, is not only part of our history, but I think part of the DNA and the culture DNA that we, that we, that we grew up in. And, um, and also since the character of Don is based on your mom, and your mom is a daughter to a Holocaust survivor. I think that some of the inheritance of um, of people who are who are um, children of Holocaust survivors is that there's a certain um, fear and anxiety that may be associated for some people with neighbors specifically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a it so happens that um, uh, my grandmother, her sisters were. Um, were burned alive in a barn um, in a, in a small town called Yadovna um, in Poland by their by their um, Polish neighbors. It's a it's a famous uh, uh, story. The, there's a book written about it called Neighbors. So for people who are who are um, uh, descendants of of, uh, of Holocaust survivors, there is sometimes fears relating to your neighbors and neighbors who may turn you in neighbors who may, um, who may cause you harm um, is, uh, is something that is a little bit baked into the psychology. So I, I don't think that it's um, out of the realm of possibility that some of the fear specifically, because I mean, paranoia can manifest itself in many different forms, and, uh, but affected specifically for your mom also, who was Jewish and was the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, neighbors were somehow associated with, with fear and paranoia probably has some relation to, uh, to the cultural um, historical legacy mm -hmm. um, of, being, uh, of being Jewish. But then again, I mean, you have many people with paranoia who are, I think that the government is spying on them or, that, or whatever other, whatever other um, uh, matters are in the news very often kind of tend to uh, penetrate people's subconscious and, and influence their paranoias, possibly for, for Jewish people, uh, mm -hmm. Holocaust related um, um, traumas. Uh, play a role in that. That's such a great, great comment. Thanks for that insight. And I think also speaks to very often with delusional psychosis, there is a nugget that makes sense, right? It's not entirely nonsensical, but there's some beginning that makes sense. Um, and that's what makes it so hard to let go of, you know, that you're, you're, it's so, in, it, it's so hard to challenge it because it starts with something that, that really could be true. Um, so I, I often say, you know, I do know that the United States government could be tracking everything I do and say and think, I mean, it would be a waste yeah. of resources, yeah. like you couldn't believe. It'd be a very boring, <laughs> uninteresting report, but they could do it, right? But I don't worry about it, right? But when that nugget's true, it makes it much harder to challenge it and move past it. Um, and so that's a really important historical nugget, I think, for Jewish people that we would need to pay attention to and validate to some extent. You know, that would be, be helpful to them. That's yeah. great, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. yeah.
There's another question. Yeah. Do you want you to uh, sure. Uh, from Jared, um, how do you ensure an audience will understand the messages of the film? Is there a specific method that is uh, used, like a test audience? There is a test audience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we did. Do you want to? No, no, go ahead. Oh, no, we, we, we did actually um, uh, do a screening for a test audience. Um, uh, I think uh, when we had a rough cut uh, a few weeks before we locked the post-production, though, at least the, the editing process. And it's very helpful. Also, we shared a screenplay when we originally wrote. We shared a screenplay with a lot of friends and, uh, and even with some, with some uh, uh, therapists. And we got, we got some, uh, some insights. Um, and then we did a test screening. And you see how people respond. Um, also, you constantly get feedback even during the even during you know production. There's so many crew members and actors, and people have questions, and you're constantly improving. And uh, um, sitting the night before, two hours before you wake up for for a shoot, and like, oh, I need to change that scene. I need to I need to polish that. But, um, but so uh, many people see things differently too. Yeah. That was what was interesting. Like they take different things, they interpret things differently. Yeah. Um, they they have different feedback. So yeah, that was, I mean it is very helpful. Yeah. You can never really ensure like what message they're they're taking from it exactly, but um, if you're pretty clear about it, hopefully that'll translate. Um, yeah, to, um, and, and 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 sometimes the, there are things that we thought would be more clear, and they're not necessarily. Um, you know, the the movie ends with a with a shot of uh, of the pool, which is open for the first time, suggesting that they overcame the the trauma of the father's death, who who drowned in the pool, had a heart attack in the pool, and um, um, and we and to us this was a pretty obvious um, symbol of how they they overcame that trauma. We rarely ever hear anyone commenting on it. Maybe some people notice it. I assume most people don't. Um, but but that's okay. I mean, it's nice for a movie to have layers. Or, different people to get different things. So um, uh, I guess every person takes whatever is relevant to their own, to themselves and to their own lives. But also things that seem so obvious on paper, don't, don't you know, um, you don't translate to screen as well in the sense of like, we thought the tree of decaying throughout the film, like the constant decay. I think we had to even take out a few times and say, I thought this is way too obvious. Um, but, but then in the film, it just swings by so. So, you know, kind of like on paper, things definitely come out different than on screen. Thank you. Thank you. I think we lost picture. Can you guys hear oh, us? No, yeah, yeah. Oh, there you are, okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, let's see. How long question. did, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, right. The book Neighbors is by Jan Gross. Exactly. How long did it take from writing the script, filming, and then the Boston Film Festival? So um, this project had uh, an extremely fast evolution, especially since some of the projects that we're pushing now, we've written seven, eight years ago. So um, uh, this one moved uh, exceptionally fast. We wrote it at the end of 2018, um, met, uh, met our producer, who, uh, as Christian, unfortunately, since uh, passed away uh, last year. Um, at, the, at the end of that year, I think it was around uh, um, exactly three years ago, it was December. Mm -hmm. And then by, um, by March, we're doing, uh, or February or March, we're uh, scouting Syracuse uh, where, we, uh, where we filmed. And by um, April 29th, May, we're in production. So it moved really, really fast. Then the pandemic really slowed us down. Um, we were waiting to premiere the film and, uh, and then COVID happened and, uh, we're, and some festivals didn't, didn't happen. Some went virtual and, uh, and at the beginning, um, uh, different people recommended we don't go virtual with the film because of a concern of piracy, sharing it online. So we passed on some festival opportunities and then we had, uh, um, and then we're supposed to, to, uh, to screen it, uh, in the Chinese theater in LA, one of the biggest theaters, uh, opening night in uh, the second largest festival in LA. And then uh, that festival <laughs> went virtual as well. We actually never got to see the movie with audience. Um, and then uh, Boston, I think was, uh, was uh, in September of, uh, of 2020. And then uh, um, we had plans to distribute the film with, uh, for a while Sony were interested, but then for whatever reason, people assume that during COVID, during a pandemic, uh, there'll be less interest in sad dramas. So uh, that didn't happen as well. And then it took some, some more time to find, uh, to find distribution and then eventually release it in May, which was uh, which is Mental Health Awareness Month. 
So, um, so how long they're asking from writing the script? Until, yeah. So, I mean, so how long total? it was, uh, well, we, we actually moved into production within several months and then we had the movie ready within completed within mm -hmm. about a year. Um, and then festivals were, you know, throughout the following year. And this year was the year of the release and we're still dealing with, uh, and that was fast. Like yeah, we have other projects. That was exceptionally <laughs> fast. Um, <laughs> yeah. We're now trying to push some products that we've written years before. So, uh, but they come back, they circle back sometimes, you know, years later. So it's not, it's not always a waste. Yeah. Um, let me see if I missed any other questions. Uh, I have a question actually um, about the pandemic specifically. You mentioned how it was exceptionally fast, but did the pandemic hinder your um, your filming abilities and your script writing abilities at all, or was it still like pretty streamlined process even through being virtual? Well, we we, we filmed in twenty nineteen before the pandemic. We actually uh, completed uh, post production I think in November of twenty nineteen. So everything was before the pandemic. Um, it just hurts the the second um, part of uh, or the fourth part of uh, making the movie uh, distribution festivals um, sales um, even now uh, I mean you know uh, uh, even now with foreign sales a lot of companies that would otherwise buy the movie have theatrical business models M many uh, when many went bankrupt originally we had one of the bigger agencies in uh, in town uh, called Paradigm uh, uh, as our as the sales reps of the of the movies uh, they were supposed to sell it to our uh, distributors. Then um, uh, they're just about to go out with the with the movie, and then the pandemic happened, and they uh, they fired their entire indie sales department, and uh, and the person who was uh, was our sales agent. So that uh, that affected us, and the festivals all went virtual. So I mean, it it was uh, yeah, the pandemic definitely really. Um, and it the movie would would have been a much bigger and wider release probably with Sony uh, if it weren't for the pandemic, but. Uh, many people were affected in much, uh, much yeah, worse Yeah, like if ways. we were filming during it, that would have been yeah. much worse. So many productions were halted. So, so yeah. at least, you know, it was only the aftermath. And then in terms of writing, it didn't really affect us because we write from home. So we're one of the few people that actually <laughs> weren't affected, yeah. thankfully. Um, but it's kind of depressing. <laughs> affected it in that way. <laughs> so yeah, we got lucky in terms of not filming during COVID. Yeah. Um, what, what was the significance of the tree and what made it her father's tree? Yeah, so we were focused on the tree when we were yeah. talking about it too. Um, the, um, so we see what, um, what is the, the apparent trigger for her, uh, for her uh, paranoia begins with the, with the, the neighbor hitting the, hitting the tree, at the, which as we hear, she refers to the dead tree. Which is just interesting how people's narratives very often affect, uh, always affect how they see the world, but especially you know when it comes to mental illness, how people's narratives shape how they view traumas. Clearly, Don took it so much more personally, as this as if this was an assault on the father and the memory. You know, the neighbor hates dead street, and that ended up being the a, a trigger for for you know that for her you know paranoia that keeps uh, spiraling down as a result. And then uh, three times throughout the movie, we see the tree decaying and decaying in a way that reflects uh, Don's mental um, deterioration throughout the throughout the film. And uh, by the time Melanie returns home from college, um, we see that the, the tree is already dead and, and fully uh, fully decayed. Um, there was one of the just one symbol that we that we threw in. We we used several throughout the throughout the story. Um, there was. Uh, there's another uh, question. I love this question. Somebody asked, uh, what advice do you have for those of us who want to focus on an advanced degree in psychology and or counseling? So I can only speak for my experience, but um, know what you're getting into before you do it. Um, a lot of people dropped out uh, because they didn't realize there's, in addition to the two years of, you know, masters that it takes, there's also 3000 hours of, of actual service you have to provide. And those 3000 hours will be harder than anything else you do in your life because a you're less experienced and b you're dealing with uh, uh clients that you may not necessarily like the field that you choose like you have to i mean i worked with disadvantaged youth which was the most challenging group of people there were you know it was an amazing like gratifying experience but at the same time so challenging um at that time when you're when you're still kind of a kid yourself um 
So many were in gangs. Many came yeah. from families with yeah. very, very serious traumas. Yes. And uh, um, stories. So it was very challenging. It was yeah. very hard. It's very, it's very hard not to cry every day when you hear every story and just build up that, that, um, that resilience. So, so my advice is just you know, you make sure that's really what you want to do. Um, that you have a passion for it. Um, and you probably do if you're if you chose it to begin with. Um, just ha- you know, adjust your expectations and know that it's going to be very difficult emotionally, more than a lot of other fields. Um, and you know, you're being relied on by by other people, and and so just just know that um, the the barriers before you you get yeah. into it. But but it is very rewarding, I will say, if you if you stick with it. I remember when you were studying uh, marriage and family therapy and I was still uh, and I was writing at home and you would come back home after a day of listening to people's traumas and tragedies and being heartbroken. And I would come home and be like, okay, so like, you know, this scene, you know, they were like, how, how about story, the this yeah, It really puts about. things in perspective, um, <laughs> which in general is very important. There's a, it's one of the paradoxes maybe of, of, of what we do on the one hand, it's nonsense. It's fiction. It's not real. It's it, it, it's sometimes mind-boggling how much our culture is obsessed with movies and shows and and content that is that is fake. When so much you know real drama is happening around the world that is so much more meaningful, and how much um, Im- importance and, and and silly importance is attributed to oh, people really? who are in this. No, no. But but I'm saying there's a. I mean. It, so much of our culture is obsessed with, you know, film stars and, you know, all this, all this nonsense. So it's it very often, even as storytellers, it, it's, you know, you ask yourself, you know, is this really, I mean, it's just a made up story. I mean, is it really worth, you know, spending years of our life on this? On the other hand, beyond the aspects of, of a career, um, it is sometimes meaningful. Sometimes you, you are lucky to tell stories that are, that have a certain importance and resonate with people and maybe nourish people's minds, just like, you know, people need food. They also need mental nourishment. And sometimes, and sometimes stick with people and, and maybe even help them or help them view things differently yeah. or develop empathy toward people who are um, who have different you know circumstances than they do um, as an empathy tool I think that it's a that it's a cinema could be a very effective one I think that maybe one of the lessons that we personally learned um, in the process of, of dealing with your mom which as I mentioned was really heartbreaking you see someone that you love really living in a nightmare that you can't wake them up from and believing that not only are they being persecuted and tormented daily, but also their family doesn't believe them and, and, and thinks that they're crazy, which to someone with paranoia, um, suggesting that they have mental, mental illness is, is it's such a betrayal. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah. As we see in the, in the police and even though things never quite got that far, but, but for a very long time, we, we try to avoid, tackling it head on directly and, and, and telling your mom, we think that you have a problem because we knew that, that, that it very likely won't help and it will only um, create um, anger. And, uh, and after a while, when all other tactics failed, we actually try to tackle it head on and say, um, you know, we think we love you, but we think that you have a problem. We think that you need help. And that day, the, the relationship, which was a very loving and close relationship, you of course had such a, such a, such a wonderful bond mm-hmm. but but even for me as, as a son-in-law I mean, we had such a good relationship but the day that we that we said that the relationship really took a nose that which was heartbreaking but and, and and very often the honest truth is that she was difficult to 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 be around like many people with mental illness and it really requires growing in empathy and understanding she didn't choose that anymore as we say in the movie which was an important line for us she didn't choose mental illness any more than a person chooses cancer or diabetes it's not it's it's very easy to blame people for for being difficult but when you really think about it the fact that it's not their fault they didn't choose this you it really requires growing in empathy which was also part of the narrative that we wanted for melanie um part of why we we, we put in that scene that she goes to, to the party and she uh and she smokes weed and she drinks and she and she trips and she has a bad a bad trip and she uh and she uh, uh she starts being paranoid for a couple of hours we really wanted her to have the experience of being in her mother's shoes for a couple of hours and just and, and growing in empathy so we felt like um um that was an important part of the narrative and circling back to to the origin of the question i think that it's also a, um an important part of cinema or movies when you know or, or the few of them who are 
or, or those that, that, that tell important stories that sometimes it allows you to, to develop empathy towards characters with very different life experiences than yours and see the world through their eyes. Someone asked. Oh, the title. What's the mean, yeah, meaning oh, yeah, of the course. title. We always, <laughs> we always get that answer. And we always that get that question, question. Yeah, yeah, about the title of the movie. So, um, uh, so originally when we wrote the screenplay, it was Untitled Paranoia Movie. And we kept trying to think of a title that would be a metaphor for paranoia. So we tried to run with different ideas like paper sharks but, but or paper. But explain like paper, because yeah, paper's yeah. fake, so so you know it's not real. So an unreal threat. An unreal threat, and then we try to think of something that is a threat to most people. Um, but but then uh, like a paper shark or a paper yeah. spider, like like, like a, a threat that is not real. And then by the time that we got to, to the end of the movie, we asked ourselves, okay, so how do we suggest that she's been in the psychiatric hospital for a while? rather than just a few days. And we said, oh, maybe every day, you know, she gets a pill cup. And then eventually we see she did something with those pill cups and they're all on the mental at the end when, when, when we pull back and, uh, and, uh, and we see, you know, that she was probably there, you know, for, for uh, yeah, 30 days or so. And then we said, oh, what if she crafted them into little paper spiders? Paper sharks would just be too hard. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> so there it goes. There and, then, uh, and then it became a metaphor for uh, both for, for mental illness, for paranoia, as well as recovery. And when we wrote that, we said, well, we're not going to interpret it um, for people. We're just going to let them understand whatever they, they make of it and, you know, let them have whatever interpretation they want. And since then, every Q&A and every conversation and every <laughs> festival screening that we had, that's the first question yeah. to come up and we end up interpreting it. So uh, <laughs> apologies. <Yeah. laughs> um, you got a question. What advice do you have? For those of us who are involved in communication studies and prepared um, for, oh, um, I'll, I'll read the question out loud. Uh, you know, and what advice do you have for us, uh, for those of us who are enrolled in communication studies and preparing for after graduation? What about internships? Um, I think the internships are very valuable in order to get a, um, in order to get a, um, an insight into how things work in the, whether it's a film industry or, 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 or other fields of communication, uh, television or uh, new media. Um, in anything really, I mean, even in, in non-media related uh, um, aspects, um, you, you learn so much more from experience than you can. I mean, theoretical studies in school are obviously extremely important and probably, you know, in, uh, I mean, they're absolutely crucial in, you know, psychology and such. I mean, you can be, you can be a self-taught, you know, um, therapist yeah, um, and work, but uh, with film you can, and, and some aspects of communication, you can do it without studying, but obviously studying provides you, you know, tool. yeah, with tools, which then you get to hone when you, um, uh, with field experience or, you know, internships, or if you're interested in, in any aspects of production, it's really, I often say, I, I, I made a short film after, uh, after, uh, after college. And I think that in, uh, in two weeks on set, I probably learned more than I did in, uh, in the two years that I spent at USC. And the two years that I spent at USC, I learned so much, they're invaluable, but there's something about doing that is, uh, um, that is just, it's another crucial aspect of, uh, of, uh, of learning. So both are very important theoretical studies as well as the practical ones. I have an extended question to that one about the um, internships and I'm going to tag onto that networking. You live in the land of networking. Um, for anyone who did not hear, Natalie and Inan live in LA and networking happens a lot. Can you talk a little bit about that even in both of your fields and even the act of what we're doing today, right, is a form of networking. We have a lot of students. We have some first years who are just beginning the process of reaching out to close networks, but then we know as we get further along in our studies and our professional development, how critical that is. So if you don't mind just sharing a little bit about networking and how that helped to uh, shape this project and really extend it to, because what I know, right, is that it really requires, you can't live in the silo vacuum in a creative universe, but also in the therapy universe, right? You can't just be a great practitioner without a network for clients, work, Etc. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. it's uh, it, it can't be understated. I mean, the networking is so crucial in this in, in this business. And first of all, specifically with with, with film and, and production, but I mean, it's true to so many other things. But specifically in the world of film, the number of people who want to do it compared with the number of people who end up you know succeeding in it is uh, the number is so small. It's just it's such a tough business. 
it, it, it in general it's very hard to monetize creative pursuits but uh but specifically with film being such a prize thing that so many people are interested in doing it's extremely hard and it's and you constantly have to hustle and you constantly have to network and it's really knowing the people who may help you who, whose interests are aligned with your interests who are who may you know that you may want to collaborate on it begins actually it begins in college i mean for me usc um I didn't think of it as networking because I was just hanging out with friends, but, uh, but I spent so much time just developing relationships with people that also genuinely enjoyed the relationship with, with and, and, and also I would say to that extent that very often the most effective networking is really one that is genuine and it's not, you know, viewed, you don't, you know, people are not being viewed as just, oh, this is a, this is a person who would be useful for me, but actually developing, you know, genuine uh, friendly relationships. But, uh, but it's extremely important. Um, so many of our projects that we ended up dedicating years of our lives to, um, and many that were rewarding in different ways, even if they didn't come to fruition yet, were the result of meeting the right person at the right time and, and, you know, and, and, and forming a relationship and, and then saying, you know, let's find something to work on together. And it's such a tough business that takes so much hustling that without also investing part of your resources and energy into networking, um, I, I just I can't I can't even imagine uh, getting a, getting a leg up in it. And uh, in this case, this movie started with uh, with reaching out to uh, to Ash Christian, our our producer. We then brought on another producer, and um, um, and without that meeting, possibly that story would never would never have uh, seen the light of day, and we, we wouldn't be here. So everything is yeah. built by networking, and it's funny because writers are so not networky their type, so it's kind of like. It's always hard for writers to be like, they have these events um, a lot of the times um, for starting writers that you just see like everybody kind of on their own and it's like a networking like event. speed dating. Yeah, it is like speed dating. But, um, but it, it is, it's so important. And like, you don't know, said your, you know, your peers, your colleagues for counseling too, the ones that you're in school with. I mean, those are the ones you'll be referring to, you know, giving referrals to. So it's really, it's really, really important. Um, yeah, one of those things that you realize more in hindsight, you know, like when you're older, oh, I should have networked more. Yeah, a little more tricky in the world of, uh, of Zoom and, uh, yeah. and virtual uh, meetings instead of, uh, instead of uh, uh, live events, but, uh, but there are always opportunities. Yes. Okay, we've got a question out of the classroom. Kathleen, did you? Oh, you guys already answered the question. It was the title one. Okay, Catherine, yep. Yeah. Was it difficult to cast the roles of Don and Melanie, and what is that process like? Could you hear? Yes, yeah, yeah, we, we did. Was it was it difficult to, to cast the roles of Don and Melanie, and uh, um, and what was it like? Uh, do you want to start? Oh, well, for Don, I mean, we we were in love with Lily Taylor, like for you know the longest time. We saw her in American Crime too, and then really like we wished that one day we could have a project that would be so right that she would play that role. Um, we just didn't at the time. Like we used to write thrillers, and, and that didn't really work for you know she wouldn't be right for that. Um, and then when we when we wrote this, I mean, we it, we thought like she'd be perfect, but it's it's also so hard to you know get the actor that you want. So um, we were so pleasantly surprised and exhilarated when she said yes. Um, and for so for the mom, it was kind of you know easy for us because we loved her so much. Um, for the daughter Melanie, uh, it was harder because. Um, there's this thing called Instagram and, you know, Twitter and where you have like all these followers and you have to now in this world, you know, judge on, you know, kind of how many followers do they have and, and versus like the talent. So we didn't Which wanna, we tried to really not make yeah, a part we didn't of our decision. Do that. We um, would get <laughs> agents sending us, you know, sending us emails with like, you know, so-and-so has 20 million Instagram followers and it's very hard to resist when you're like, well, I really like the actress who doesn't have a, a following. But, uh, but then, you know, resisting the, the idea that, you know, millions of people will see, will see someone. And, you know, we, we, we cast, uh, you know, Peyton Liss in a small role and she has a very large following. But, uh, but for the role of Stefania, we, we, we really didn't wanted, know, we didn't we want to Stephanie. test the right person yeah. and a person who would reflect kind of the, the gist since the, the character is inspired by you. Someone who would reflect you. That doesn't even have to be, you know, someone who would look, you know, exactly like you, but but, but someone who would, would, the essence, you know, would be, would kind of be your essence. Well, originally also we, we kind of in our head, in my head at least, they, she was supposed to be a little younger, um, like even 14, 15. So that innocence was really important. Um, she wasn't that age because that's harder for production, but. And also <laughs> what we wanted to be, to, but, to go through the coming of age story where she's about to move up to college. Sure. Yeah. 
Um, but the, that innocence was important. And we didn't know of Stefania um, at the time, the actress that plays Melanie. Um, and then we just kept getting like audition after audition. And it was just like, it is kind of like dating where it's like, mm, not quite right. I, I think we watched 80 yeah, something uh, auditions from girls who uh, um, many of them excellent actresses and, and well-known and very good and gave good auditions, good reads. And for some reason, it just wasn't right. We often say it's a little similar to dating. You, you can't quite put into words why a certain person isn't right even when they seem right on paper, but they're not. There's just, there isn't that thing. And, uh, um, and actually the actress who were, before we saw Stefania's audition, the actress who was at the top of our list um, um, of all the ones that we saw and that we even met with her, um, was uh, an actress who was excellent and would have also been very good in the movie, but, uh, but she was 27. She seemed younger. She could pass as, you know, early 20s, but uh, it was just hard to, to, hard to see her as a 17-year-old. And it just felt like there was a certain sophistication and a certain maturity that just they, they didn't feel like she's 17 anymore. It didn't feel like she's just... Uh, She's just starting like that, that journey, like that, that innocence, that naivete, mm -hmm. which was so crucial and, uh, and also creates so much empathy for someone that wasn't there. So we kept, we kept looking, even though we really, really liked that actress and, and she, was, she was also excellent. And then uh, so many of the auditions uh, nowadays come in, uh, in recorded, they're just being recorded and sent, which is easier to watch them on your computer rather than someone coming into the room to audition physically, even though many people did as well. And, uh, and I think after seeing 84 auditions, uh, Stefania's came in. It was like the last one too. And they're like, yeah. this is all we got. And it was getting close. Like we needed to kind of make a decision, but like, yeah. it was almost, uh, I, we're in different rooms. I think that we were a day away from, from um, saying yes to the, to the other actress who was yeah. 27, but was by far the best of the, of the list. And then Stefania's audition came in. We never heard of her before. We never saw her in anything. And we watched two minutes of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of an addition with the homeless alley scene and the shopping scene as a lighter, um, as an example for a lighter scene. And I think that even the, the tape was, was, was uh, cut, like it didn't even complete the full, the full edition. It was, it was like one of the, and yet like we watched two minutes of her and we're like, she's the one. Yeah. And I think it came late, late at night. I was in the office, Natalie was in the bedroom. We we're watching on, on uh, I was watching That's on my nice. desktop. She was watching on this laptop and we both watched her. And, and we, said, wow, she's the one, we found the one. Oh, so, but then, <laughs> uh, but, but then to, to elaborate, um, so when you cast good actors, you know that they're going to be good, or at least you, you hope, sometimes you don't know what's, what else may be going on in their lives. And also they are such a pleasure to work with, I mean, as, as people, they're wonderful, but you never quite know what kind of a chemistry they'll, they'll develop. It's especially important in, you know, in movies that feature romantic relationships, very often you hear all oh, behind the scenes, the scenes, the guy and the girl hated each other. And then you learn, well, and then you see the movie and you're like, yeah, it shows like there's no chemistry there. <laughs> Similarly, with any movie that has a strong relationship, um, like a mother daughter movie, it was essential to really believe that they're a mother and daughter to really feel like that connection exists. And it's not a given. And when we cast it, we didn't know Lillian and Stefania didn't know each other um uh never met before and we didn't know if they will hit it off uh it wasn't a given that they would and lucky for us that they, they really really did they, they connected instantly they developed a, a real kind of mother-daughter relationship um off screen that really translated on screen and that's something that's very very hard to control as uh as a filmmaker you really just have to uh, cross your fingers and pray and they both said that they really related to the role on a personal yeah. level yeah oh. um, both of them have um experience with uh, bipolar family members. So uh, they a huge coincidence, there, yeah, which is also goes know. to show yeah. how common it is. Like yeah. they both had a close member that, and they drew from that and like, I guess that, you know. And it showed, they yeah. really, they put their hearts and souls into the role and they really brought something very real um, into the movie. They were both just outstanding actors. I mean, they both did such a great job. We've got a question here from Emma. Yeah. Um, how come you made Daniel have his own problems instead of being more of a role model character, like a helper? The question is why, so why did we make Daniel have his own problems instead of being yeah. a role model character? Um, there's something that we aspire to when we write scripts. Um, we often don't succeed in that, but, uh, but we, we usually aspire to have some kind of a thematic unity where every, where every um, 
uh, narrative, including the subplots of the movie, um, somehow relate to the main to the main narrative of the of the story. And we knew that this movie was about mental illness. We felt like if we were to present, and we didn't want the 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 romantic relationship that is kind of like the B story to be um, unrelated. Um, and we felt like we would like it to add to the conversation, but we felt like it would be too um, coincidental and feel contrived if he was also dealing with some form of mental illness, but we felt like it would be interesting in having a conversation if he was dealing with some lighter form of addiction, which definitely <clears throat> in many ways cannot be compared with mental illness. But on the other hand, there are ways in which it can contribute to that conversation. Um, and, uh, and trying to support someone with addiction um, very often uh, could be similar to trying to support someone with, uh, with mental health issues. And we felt like there's something about Melanie's character that is a bit of a natural caregiver, someone who's very caring and very empathetic. And, and very often you see those people subconsciously entering relationships where they're the caregiver. And, uh, and we felt like it wouldn't be surprising if even in other aspects of her life, she would end up finding herself in a relationship where she's someone to be relied on. Um, and, uh, um, and, and like trying to yeah. fix people. Cause that's a lot of times what happens like when you're used to that and you have a parent or someone that you love, you, you kind of gravitate towards those relationships, um, trying to fix them. That's also like a lesson for, to answer the question earlier about psychology. The, one of the biggest things I learned um, in counseling is that you actually can't a lot of the time fix people um, as, as much as you try. And it's a really frustrating thing. Um, there's this thing called the cognitive behavioral therapy, which is like very systematic and, and it has techniques to be, you know, kind of like fixing, but if you just recognize that you may not be able to, you know, fix them, um, that, that's a little liberating. Um, you can help them and hopefully you can give them tools to, you know, help their future. But, but, um, but anyway, to answer the question, yeah. So we wanted, we, we thought that that would make her, you know, more authentic all around if she is kind of like that fixer and, and tries to, you know, help everybody and can't and ultimately literally tells them, I can't fix you. Yeah, I see, yeah, yeah. I see another question here. Thank you, that, that was a very good question. Um, Lauren asked, um, what are the ways that you inspire creativity in your process, especially overcoming writer's block, mm -hmm. et cetera? It's a really good question. Yeah. Um, it's part of the reality of being a writer that you feel stuck definitely helps to have a writing partner um, and uh, someone to, uh, to inspire you and to bounce ideas off of and to find, um, and to find uh, inspiration in. Um, uh, do, do you wanna take I just like, for me, usually when you're not trying, I don't know if this is like this in other fields, but when you're not trying and that's when you're able to crack something, but if you're really like sitting there, for me, sitting there and trying to crack a, a, a story or a character or a situation, that's when it's the hardest. Um, so get, getting up and, and, and leaving it alone or, or talking. I mean, yeah, most of our stories are, are made and built by conversations yeah. Yeah. rather than the actual writing of it. Because that part goes fast. It's like the figuring it out the story and the talking yeah. about it. That's what takes time. And, and uh, as some writers say, if any more inspiration would come from, I would go there more often. I mean, it's, it's hard to find inspiration. Natalie, for example, is a much more inspired person than me. She can come up with an idea a day. Whereas I can take a year to find an idea that I'm really passionate enough about to spend years uh, developing. But um, I think that, uh, I think that uh, ideally if you have a writing partner, you know, you, you challenge each other to come up with, with inspiration and you, and you try to, and you try to um, uh, soak as much inspiration from, from the other person. Sometimes from research, from whatever interests you, um, when you don't have a writing partner or don't have your writing partner at the moment, very often you need to ask yourself those questions that you would otherwise ask someone else. And I find that, uh, that a, a question that, that's very often, that is very important to the writing process is asking yourself, which, which seems like the simplest and most basic question, but in, very often it's also, it's also a profound one, is, that, is asking yourself, what is, this, what is this project really about? What is the story really about? What does it mean? And when I ask myself that question or when I ask others that question when, you know, about a project, I don't mean what is the plot, but what is this project actually saying? What is the heart of this movie? What do you want people to take away from the story? What is, what is it really about? And sometimes it takes a lot, of, a lot of thinking to distill it into an idea or very often even to find what it is that really attracts you to a project. Sometimes there are stories that that seem to be about one thing, 
But when you really challenge yourself, you realize, well, the thing that actually I'm really passionate about is this is this smaller aspect of the story that isn't the, the, the that is a different one. But uh, um, but that's the thing that that's really interesting to me. Or what I'm really interested in is in exploring that relationship or that situation or that character. And very often, it's not what the film appears to be about in the log line. So in the in the one line description of of what the story is about. So asking yourself what is it about is important throughout the entire process, not only when you're starting to come up with an idea, but also when you ask yourself um, uh, later down the line, what is the right decision? I can, I can turn right or left. I can take this story in one direction or the other. And very often there isn't a clear answer and even on a scene level. And then you ask yourself, well, what best supports the original thesis or the original idea um, at the core of the, of the story, the original premise? And that usually helps you um, kind of make sure that you're steering yourself in the right direction. Um, beyond that, um, I mean, every person has their own ways to, uh, to find inspiration. I mean, sometimes it's research, sometimes it could be, you know, music, you know, listening to a song that for some reason really speaks to you. And very often, you know, we delve into research about products that we, they don't originate with us and that it, are not something that we personally know as much about. And then we try to soak inspiration for the material itself. But also you change what you want, or sometimes you do, at least we did. Um, you know, we, as we got older, we were more interested in, you know, stories about, that had a heart and stories about personal dramas, things like that. Um, in the beginning, I, I mean, I still love comedies, you know, love thrillers, but we used to write a lot more of that. And then as we got older, we kind of change. You just, you, you grow up and you, and you, you, you think you, you don't want to write about something and then you kind of learn about yourself with the process and what you like. So, I mean, it's really important to just keep doing what you're doing because you will change. And I feel like in every field, you'll, you'll kind of learn to discover what kind of clients, you know, you, where's your niche and um, with psychology at least. Um, but also in film. Yeah. I think that, uh, um, I think that, you know, throughout life, you, you get an opportunity to hone your and find your, your voice, which in a way I feel like perhaps Natalie has done even more than me. She's written, I mean, this is one project that got made but Natalie has written a few stories that, um, um, that are inspired by different events, aspects of, of her life. And um, I actually, I never really wrote something that was as personal um, or the, where I really saw myself reflected in the characters on screen, which is not necessarily the, the way to go. I mean, there are many different ways to, uh, to tell stories, but kind of finding your voice, finding what it is that you're interested in, finding, um, finding what it is that really speaks to you is important and it's true as Natalie said that that, that keeps changing. Um, some of the scripts that we've written five years ago that at the time I was very passionate about today don't speak to me as much and uh, yeah I feel like yeah as life goes by um, uh, as for me I, I find myself more interested sometimes in dramas than, than thrillers even though we, we're pursuing both which what is answering the next question what are about future projects. Future next projects. Um, so, uh, um, I mean, we, we've written several that uh, uh, hopefully will move into, into production next year. Uh, at least one of them, we'll see. Um, one, for example, uh, and, and also an example for a story that we knew nothing about and uh, came from research, the story of a, um, of a blind prosecutor who ended up suing the second largest pharmaceutical company in the world for fraud when uh, she discovered that the uh, best-selling antidepressant in the world, marketed as remarkably safe and effective for children. The company knew it was not only ineffective on children, but drove them to suicide. And uh, she ended up, uh, while coping with a recent vision loss and becoming uh, totally blind, she ended up uh, um, leading this lawsuit that uh, was really transformational, not only specifically about this drug, but about um, uh, forcing pharmaceutical companies to share their data um, about clinical trials which is a subject that's still very, very uh, relevant today and there's still a long, long ways to go. So that's an example for a story that you know, did not originate with us. I, I, read, um, I read a book that was written about her and some other individuals and I contacted the author and I contacted the, the woman that the story is based on and got their, and got their, uh, um, their uh, right. life rights and, and book rights to, uh, to develop it into a screenplay. And I think it's been six years since we wrote it and, um, and only in the last few months we started, we've had different producers on board that came on and, you know, and wanted changes and rewrites and then, you know, and then, you know, left the project and then other producers came on board. And now with the producer of uh, Paper Spiders and uh, um, we're 
finally starting to uh, to get some some traction and hopefully we'll move forward. We also have you know thrillers and dramas with mm -hmm. different projects uh, that we've written that are uh, hopefully one of them will move uh, will move forward in the coming year. Did we miss any questions? I don't know. We're seeing about questions. anybody else in the classroom with questions. Okay, so last chance to throw questions in the chat if anybody um, who's in the Zoom would like to ask questions. Um, I just wanted to take time to just really thank you so sincerely for taking time out of your schedule to talk with us today. Of course, our uh, pleasure. It's such a beautiful film. Um, and, you know, as a psychologist, um, it's so important to have films that show not only the complexity of mental illness and relationships, um, but the hope, right, that she did get better, that once she accepted something was wrong, it helped her get the help that she needed. Um, but it was just so also realistic, like the, the happy ending maybe isn't the happiest thing that could happen, but it's still a, a life worth living. Um, and that, you know, this, this relationship came to that by supporting one another and helping one another. Um, and I think for everybody who cares about someone who has a mental illness, they need to hear that because of how hard it is, you know, throughout the process. Um, so it really is just a beautiful gift to the field of psychology. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, coming from the field of psychology to give it because I, I can, I just know there's so many people and so many students who I'm going to have watched that this to, to take that from it. Um, and I think um, it's just a, a great gift. So thank you for doing that. Thank, thank you. you. And, and, yeah. and thank you so much yes. for, for showing the film. Thank you to everyone who watched it and, and asked questions and took um, two hours of your, of your day to, uh, to watch the movie. It's really, it's also a pleasure for us as filmmakers to be able to, uh, to share the, the movie with people and, and actually also see them. As I mentioned, we never even had the experience of, uh, of, um, watching the movie with an audience even when, when it was in theaters in May. So, uh, um, so it's really, it's really, it was a pleasure speaking with everyone and we're, we're grateful to everyone who hosted the, the film and, uh, and thank you for, thank you for having thank us you here. Thank you for your participation. Yeah. Watching. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. Um, okay. Well, thank you again for being here. We appreciate it. Very good. So thank good. you very much. You do have an audience clapping for you, right? It's not quite in real life, but we can pretend. Uh, <laughs> but again, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. So nice to meet really both of you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And then can I just ask one last question about the film specifically? What's next for the film? What um, is there an audience yet who hasn't seen it? And then, you know, who is your intended, you know, like sort of what's next and what can we do as this audience to help extend that message? Would it help if we got on social media? Let us know what we can do because we, we really support this film. Thank, thank you. you so First much. Of all, that means a lot. Thank you so much. And yeah, of course, if anyone wants to recommend the, the movie on social media to to friends or to friends or write reviews, we're always very, very grateful. It's, it's a very small meaningful. movie on a low budget, yeah. so it's hard for it to get exposure. Um, it's not where and we're competing now, like in the Gothams, we're competing with big, big films. So um, yeah. it's just hard. Like we're so grateful that Lily got an award. I mean, I was nominated for an award, but it's just hard to get that that word out because it is a small movie. So. Yeah, but relatively very few people have seen the the movie compared with you know the the potential population. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, the pandemic uh, uh, or when the pandemic started, we're still in conversations with Sony about doing a, a much wider release, and that fell through because of the pandemic. So we ended up by releasing the, the movie with a smaller distributor and definitely on a much smaller scale with a smaller um, marketing uh, um, abilities and capacities. So yeah, any word of mouth is extremely meaningful. I feel like so many of the people who are finding out about the movies thanks to our word of mouth, either on social media or positive reviews on, on Amazon or elsewhere. And uh, um, so we're always very, very grateful when-, uh, What's when next for the movie yeah. more And then, uh, yeah, so it, it, this is award season. So fortunately uh, it started off on the right foot with uh, the Gotham Awards, which are the awards for independent uh, film. Uh, Lily Taylor received the nomination for her, uh, for lead performance. And uh, we'll see, maybe we'll uh, be fortunate to, uh, to uh, have Lily and Stefania earn some more awards uh, throughout the season and, uh, and by that way help raise, the, raise some more awareness to the film. 
Um, he may uh, distribute his in conversation with Stars and Hulu, so it will probably end up on either Stars or Hulu next year, but uh, um, that may take uh, some months. So uh, for now, it's available on Amazon and all VOD, uh, and all VOD uh, um, uh, platforms. And um, yeah, and uh, hopefully we'll help uh, pave the way for the next projects. And can students also find, connect with you on LinkedIn? Um, I just dropped the, in the chat the at Paper Spiders, the movie, um, Instagram sure. username. Um, is there anywhere else that they can find you? Is it okay if they reach out on LinkedIn? I don't check my LinkedIn. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm, I just don't. I'm yeah, they, known they, can, as very active. they can feel free I to can. connect with us on, on yeah. social media. If right. anyone has any, any questions, they can, they can also email us it's uh, we're always yes. happy to help and and also I, I guess to follow up on your question about about networking it's also very very often there are individuals in our lives who have helped us and uh, and even gave us some useful advice mm -hmm. so if people uh, want advice um, uh, career advice or you yeah. know, any Same advice uh, related to psychology or film or the um, we're always happy to uh, we're always happy to do our best to, uh, to answer. Them. So, uh, yeah, um, if anyone is requesting, you can also share our emails and we're really, we're just, uh, uh, we're grateful for this opportunity and uh, always happy to help. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Toby. Okay. And thank you, Christine, and thank you to everyone. Um, and Gail and Irvin, thank you so much. Good luck, everybody. I'm, this is a, a very useful time in your life and I <laughs> wish you the best. Great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Everyone. Okay.